Change is the essence of life. The forces that mold the world as we know it are strong, mysterious. Changes are brought about by nature and by man. The islands of Hawaii are still being shaped by the forces of this earth. It is a young land continuing to grow. People have molded these islands in their own way, creating events of history that define what has become one of the most beautiful vacation destinations on Earth. But before all of this, forces more powerful from deep within the Earth's core put Hawaii on the map, literally. More than 35 million years ago, hot magma found an escape through the Earth's crust, unwitnessed deep under the ocean. The Hawaiian archipelago now extends over 1,600 miles across the mid-Pacific Ocean. It is an undersea mountain chain, the most isolated group of islands on the planet. In time, animals and plants borne by winds and sea arrived, and life blossomed. Pristine native forests carpeted the once stark volcanoes. Man, too, would come to this Eden sometime between the 6th and 9th centuries. The Hawaiian Islands, as we know them, are relatively young, less than 10 million years old. The volcanoes upon which they're built extend another three and a half miles down to the ocean floor. The ribbed mountains that rise above the sea are sculpted by time and erosion, the power of wind and rain. Kauai is the oldest island of the six major ones explored by visitors today. It's known as the Garden Isle. Its lush, gentle green valleys and mountains proclaim the power and subtlety of nature. The magnificent architecture of the Nepali cliffs rise from sea caves and ocean that delight snorkelers, scuba divers, and odd sightseers. Kauai's crown jewel is Waimea Canyon, Hawaii's version of the Grand Canyon. And there's the Fern Grotto, a popular wedding spot. And precious Hanalei Valley, where wilderness and quiet resorts combine for the perfect escape. Mount Waialeale is the wettest spot on Earth, and Kauai is the last refuge of endangered species of forest birds and plants. Maui is the second most visited island in the chain, the second largest and now the second most populated. Called the Valley Isle, Maui is actually two volcanoes right next to each other that were joined in the middle by accumulating streams of lava. Much younger than Kauai, the chiseled West Maui Mountains and Iao Valley are wilder. This is a sacred place where one can almost sense the ancient Hawaiian royalty buried here. Aleakala, the other volcano, is a wilderness protected by the National Park Service and the Nature Conservancy. More than 10,000 feet high, it is a moonscape where the sun rises in grandeur and clouds gather below. Haleakala is dormant, last erupting around 200 years ago. It took a million years to rise from the bottom of the sea. The isthmus, or central plain of Maui, now accommodates the largest producing sugar company in the state, Hawaii's third best source of revenue after tourism and defense. Some of the most exotic and heavenly rainforest in the islands and on Earth can be seen on the road to the little town of Hana. And Maui's destination resorts of Ka'anapali, Kapalua, and Wailea are some of the most famous in the world. Pure luxury and more miles of beach than any other island. The quaint historical town of Lahaina 
once the whaling capital of the Pacific and the seat of the Hawaiian royalty, now is the world capital of windsurfing. Awesome and down to earth at the same time. The island of Maui earns the local reputation Maui no Kaoi. Maui is the best. The little island of Lanai is a lazy, quiet place devoted to pineapple. Deserted beaches and crystal clear waters draw boat tours every day. The island of Molokai is known for the highest ocean cliffs in the islands, a wildlife safari park, and the famous leper colony of Kalaupapa, founded by Belgian priest Father Damien in 1873, the martyr of Molokai. He died of the disease in 1889 after building a church and homes for the stricken and treating them like they were his own. Molokai has very few good roads and is best seen by four-wheel drive. It is a place to get away and savor the feel of ancient Hawaii. Big Island of Hawaii, still growing. The newer eruptions began in 1983, adding miles of land. Volcanoes National Park is a major tourist attraction in Hawaii. It is the largest island in the chain and the newest born. The peak of Mauna Kea actually gets snow in the Hawaiian winter. A cluster of observatories keep a constant watch on the stars and planets from this ideal vantage spot and bring many astronomers from countries all over the world. Lavish resorts, a huge orchid industry, the largest privately owned working cattle ranch in the world, Parker Ranch, Akaka Falls, Kealakakua Bay, the famous site where Captain Cook landed, the first foreigner in 1787. All this and much more is a part of the Big Island. It is a world of black sand beaches and ancient Hawaiian temples revealing a rich culture and history passed on in chant and legend rather than writing. This is Pu'uhonua Ohonau Nau National Historical Park, better known as the City of Refuge. It was here that ancient Hawaiians found sanctuary to escape punishment for crimes against the strict kapu system. The most famous hula competition in the world takes place in the big island town of Hilo. And Kailua Kona is the world center for marlin fishing, hosting the yearly Hawaiian International Bill Fishing Tournament. Here on the leeward drier side of the big island, many kinds of prime catch fish are plentiful, including ahi or tuna, used for the best quality sashimi. Japanese term for raw fish. Many identify the Big Island with Madame Pele, the goddess of the volcano, who now takes up residence here. This crater of Hale Maumau erupts yearly, filling with white hot lava, creating natural fireworks and new land. The Big Island is Hawaii's temperamental infant. Finally, the island of Oahu, also called the Gathering Place, is home to 80% of the state's population and the seat of government. You'll find a rainbow of ethnic blends and cultures here, 
Most of Hawaii's five million visitors a year come to Oahu for the perfect marriage of civilization and paradise. The busy metropolis of Honolulu serves as the financial and political center of the Pacific. Honolulu means sheltered harbor in Hawaiian, for it used to be the only safe haven in the Pacific for traveling ships. During the whaling days, hundreds of ships laid anchor here. Aloha Tower was once the highest building on Oahu. It's an old familiar landmark now. This bronze statue of King Kamehameha the Great commemorates the monarch who first unified the Hawaiian Islands. The only royal palace in the United States is here in Honolulu, Iolani Palace, home to Hawaiian royalty such as King David Kalakaua or King Kamehameha III and Hawaii's beloved queen Liliokalani who wrote the famous song Aloha Oe. These are the oldest frame houses in Hawaii, the mission houses built in 1821 by New England missionaries. Downtown Honolulu has its own flavor, modern, but full of character. Waikiki is arguably the most famous beach in the world. Hard to imagine that it used to be a swamp. Most of the hotels are clustered together here, and it's an excellent place for people watching. Waikiki, of course, is full of shops and vendors, the international marketplace which glows with that barefoot go Hawaiian feeling. Dominating the Waikiki skyline is Diamond Head, an extinct volcano tuff cone where ash shot up explosively and cooled to create the very symbol of Hawaii around the world. Sailors found diamond-like calcite crystals here on its slopes 100 years ago and gave it the name Diamond Head. In Kapi'olani Park, right below Diamond Head, there's a free hula show and a lovely little zoo, perfect for peacocks and picnics. One of the largest shopping centers in the world is the Ala Moana Shopping Center, where there is a fine assortment of stores and foods from around the world. Across the street in Ala Moana Beach Park, it's a favorite vantage point for watching surfers at sunset off Magic Island. Every year, Oahu is the destination for the Trans-Pacific Yacht Race. Sailing is a year-round sport everywhere in Hawaii, and some ships with a great deal of history and class have retired here. Driving around the island of Oahu, you get away from high-rises and civilization. Anauma Bay is a marine sanctuary where the underwater world mesmerizes and explodes with color. Tame fish eat right out of your hand. This is where Elvis Presley's movie, Blue Hawaii, was shot. A winding road twists around seascape on Oahu's eastern side, volcanic rock reaching fingers into a deep blue sea. Nearby, a secluded cove waits. It is the image of anyone's dream of Hawaii. Further along the eastern coast of Oahu is one of the most highly respected oceanariums in the world, Sea Life Park, and the beaches of Makapu'u and Sandy, where the art of boogie boarding is practiced every day, not for beginners by any means. Heading for the North Shore is Hawaiian countryside and agriculture. This is old Hawaii still, preserved, and cherished. This is why the North Shore of Oahu is famous. The Big Surf, the Pipeline and Sunset Beach, Waimea Bay, great for cliff diving and 40-foot waves in the winter season. The countryside here yields miles of pineapple and sugarcane. 
the Big Dole Pineapple in Honolulu still reminds everyone that if you put a pineapple in any recipe, it immediately identifies it as Hawaiian. High atop the Ko'olau mountain range, 1,000 feet up, is the Nu'u'anu Pali Lookout, where the winds and the view are magnificent. Kamehameha the Great drove Oahu soldiers off this cliff to their deaths 200 years ago. These islands of Hawaii were first changed by the arrival of the first seafaring Polynesians, who introduced new plants, animals, and ways of life. Beginning in the late 1700s, foreigners, or haoles, brought Western religion and morality, writing politics and other new plants and animals. They also brought disease that ravaged the native population. For a while, Hawaii was the whaling capital of the Pacific. Then sugar was king. Now tourism reigns, and one of the major tourist attractions for all is on the island of Oahu, the Arizona Memorial, the tribute to that day of infamy in 1941 the day that cast Hawaii as a player in the course of world history. Once upon a time, pearl oysters were abundant in the harbor. They're gone now, but the name remains. Here at Pearl Harbor, visitors and ships come and go every day. But there are ships that never come and go. The USS Arizona, and nearby, on the other side of Ford Island, the USS Utah. There, frozen in time beneath the water's dark surface. Spanning the breadth of the sunken USS Arizona is the Arizona Memorial. It's a sweeping tribute to the 1,177 men who went down with her and to all of those who gave so much at Pearl Harbor. Now millions of people come, each on their own personal pilgrimage, to remember, relive, realize what happened that day. Man carved this harbor out of nature to provide ships safe haven from storms at sea. But it couldn't protect against a different kind of storm, one driven by the divine wind of the Japanese imperial forces. It is the 1930s, a troubled decade of depression and new deals and a gathering storm. Hitler and Nazi fanaticism has Germany in a vice. Fascism grips Italy. All of Europe is threatened by war. The empire of Japan's 100 million citizens are aflame with patriotic passion, bursting with the spirit of Japan. But the empire has exceeded its ability to find natural resources at home, to be self-sustaining. Hirohito is emperor, 124th in a line of traditional divinity. But it is the imperial army and navy that calls the shots. Proudly, they engage Japan in a policy of expansionism that focuses on conquering China, Indonesia, and the islands of the Pacific. Already, Korea, Formosa, Manchuria, and Guam have come under Japanese control. Australia, Fiji, and northern China are threatened. At this time, the U.S. is operating under a strict isolationist policy dedicated to neutrality. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is in an unprecedented third term of office. He guides the country toward recovery from the crippling depression of the 30s, and all energies are directed toward that effort. Full employment and spending on the home front, that's what most Americans want. They are not anxious to go to war. But the world axis powers of Germany, Italy, and Japan signed their initial alliance in 1937. 
Then it's March of 1938, and German troops goose-step triumphantly into Austria. The Nazi conquest of Europe has begun. Nations around the world are threatened at the borders. The free world is outraged, and it grows increasingly difficult to stay neutral in a world going to war. As Japan industrialized in the late 1800s, it depended more and more on precious oil and other materials from the United States. In spite of that, Japan ignores U.S. warnings to stop its military expansion. In 1941, Japan takes Indonesia. Immediately, President Roosevelt freezes all of Japan's assets in the U.S. and cuts off all trade and the oil supply that is so crucial to Japan's survival. Japan can find no alternate source. Either she can bow to the U.S. provisions for peace or go to war with the sleeping giant. Negotiations are in progress between the two countries, even though U.S. intelligence knows that Japan is planning a major military offensive. However, they don't know where. But this man does. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, commander-in-chief of Japan's combined fleet, is in charge of the planning and strategy of the major offensive. Not only has Yamamoto attended Harvard University, but he has served as a language officer at Naval Attaché in Britain and Washington. He understands the United States, and his plan is a brilliant one. It consists of two parts. First, a surprise assault on the U.S. Pacific Fleet to get America's stronger naval force out of the way. Then, a long-term acquisition of strategic Pacific islands to increase Japan's boundaries, making the small country less vulnerable to attack. Surprise attack is the only way with a stronger enemy. Anticipating trouble in the Pacific, Roosevelt sends the entire Pacific Fleet from San Diego to Pearl Harbor in 1937. Now the island of Oahu, home to the fighting ships and aircraft carriers, is the only obstacle left in the way of Japan's military ambitions. So on November 23, 1941, with Vice Admiral Nagumi Chuichi in charge, a fleet of 11 destroyers, three cruisers, two battleships, seven submarines, six aircraft carriers, five mini-subs, and about 360 dive bombers and fighter planes set off on the mission. On Oahu, the trade winds blow gently, as always, across beaches full of happy people. The American military is carrying on in a routine fashion, poised for any signs of war, but not expecting immediate invasion. Warplanes are lined up close at Hickam Field and other bases to protect against sabotage that is suspected of Hawaii's Japanese Americans, one third of the population at the time. In actuality, though, these citizens of the Hawaiian territory are devout and loyal to their adopted country. But it is a time of fear and mistrust. It is also just another lazy weekend in paradise. On the Japanese ships, however, 200 miles away, the men listen to Hawaiian radio on shortwave and wait to earn the highest honors one can win for their country, to fight for the spirit of Japan with bravery and commitment. As the sun rises on Sunday morning, December 7th, the first wave of planes takes off.
as Oahu is stirring. Two Army privates pick up something alarming on a portable radar unit at Opana. Yet when they call a superior, they are reassured that it's probably an expected squadron of B-17s scheduled to arrive from the States. Or it could be planes doing maneuvers from the three aircraft carriers that are presently out at sea. In reality, it is neither. No one else notices. People are still asleep. Military men are on weekend leave and security is lax on that early Sunday morning when America truly was the sleeping giant. At 7.49 a.m., the first wave of 200 Japanese fighters and torpedo planes flies over land. Back at the Japanese fleet, 200 miles away, a message crackles over the radio. Torah, Torah, Torah. The surprise attack is a complete success. They strike the first targets before anyone knows what has hit them. The sky is full of warplanes. The military bases of Hickam, Bellows, Wheeler, Ford Island, and Kaneohe are devastated. It is 7.55 a.m. The Japanese pilots zero in on their targets with precision, flying back and forth, again and again, strafing fleeing survivors. Then they turn and head for their main target, the reason for the whole attack. Floating in Pearl Harbor are the ships of the Pacific Fleet, like so many sitting ducks. On the USS Nevada, sailors attend the usual morning colors ritual. The star-spangled banner washes across the decks. It is a scene of total chaos. Like their Axis partner half a world away, the Japanese had borrowed Hitler's blitzkrieg, the lightning attack. Men are killed as they sleep, and in only 15 minutes of relentless attack, the USS California and the West Virginia are sunk, the Oklahoma capsized, and the USS Arizona is hit with a single armor-piercing bomb weighing 1,760 pounds. It penetrates the magazine area. That explosion rips through six steel decks, hitting the aviation fuel storage tank. The Arizona becomes a gigantic bomb. Explosions fill the sky with black smoke. 1,177 men are killed instantly. And in less than nine minutes, the USS Arizona sinks with most of its crew. It is the biggest single loss in American naval history. In the end, there would be only 289 survivors. Black smoke billows, and it is a living hell at Pearl Harbor. 
Men desperately try to survive by jumping ship and swimming to safety, but are assaulted by constant strafing of bullets from the low-flying Japanese planes. In shock, officers and enlisted men who didn't even have time to dress dive into the oily water, trying to help as best they can by manning what is left of the guns and saving the wounded. Many still trapped in the sinking ships can be heard beating through the walls, most to no avail. Then, 45 minutes after it began, comes the second wave. Between the torpedoes, the dive bombers, the strafing, all that can be done is to survive with what little is left. Some of the Japanese planes fly so low that the faces of the pilots and the large red suns can be seen by the helpless victims. The Japanese are having a field day. Pacific Fleet is a total loss. The Arizona and Utah sunk. The U.S. Nevada is the only ship to get underway, only to be rendered useless and run aground. It is a total victory for the Japanese. It takes less than two hours, but in that time, 2,335 American servicemen lose their lives. 1,178 are wounded. 18 ships are destroyed. 200 planes demolished. The Japanese lose only 29 planes, 150 men, one submarine, and five mini-subs. But they missed two important targets. The three U.S. aircraft carriers that were safely out at sea on maneuvers, and the oil storage tanks. One Japanese prisoner of war is taken, Ensign Kazuo Sakamaki. His mini-sub had been put out of commission earlier. Five of these little vessels had been released from a mother sub about 10 miles away to scout the area for locations of ships. Sakamaki and his crewmate became disoriented when poison gas leaked from damaged batteries on board the sub. They tried to swim ashore. The other ensign drowned. Sakamaki was to serve the warriors in a Wisconsin prison. The Japanese are jubilant. Part one of Yamamoto's plan has worked. The emperor announces a renewed commitment to war and sacrifice for the country. Oahu is in turmoil. Men remain trapped in ships. Doctors work around the clock. Civilian casualties number 68 with 35 wounded. Many are shot by American bullets fired randomly in panic and desperation. Hawaii and the world are numb, then outraged. The day after the attack, Congress meets and war is declared against Japan. The bombing of Pearl Harbor has fired up the passions of patriotism and indignation in a country that had been striving to stay neutral. President Roosevelt addresses Congress and the world. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The attack yesterday on the Hawaiian Islands has caused severe damage to American naval and military forces. I regret to tell you that very many American lives have been lost.
Japan did not expect that a major salvaging effort in Hawaii would resurrect most of the Pacific fleet and also the fighter planes that had been destroyed. Working overtime, military salvage teams perform miracles with the vessels, improving them at the same time. Many go on to the ensuing naval battles in the Pacific. Each battle becomes rallying points, whether victory or defeat. The Battle of the Coral Sea, Midway, Guadalcanal, the Battle of the Java Sea, Tarawa, Iwo Jima. This now quiet harbor serves as a reflective reminder that history can be shaped by a single event. The USS Arizona Memorial has been a part of the National Park Service since 1983, preserving forever the memory and the lesson of that day. The memorial was built directly over the sunken ship herself that can still be seen below the water. Her battle guns were never used. 1,102 men still lie entombed below the water's edge. Oil still leaks from this once proud ship that earned a battle star for its participation in the war, a ship that served only 26 years. The USS Utah holds her remaining ghostly crew of 58 men. She lies rusted but proud nearby in the harbor. Not far from this harbor is the ancient cinder cone of a volcano. It's now home to the military cemetery of the Pacific, better known as Punch Bowl. Here, the fallen from Pearl Harbor and other battles of World War II the Korean War and Vietnam are buried and honored by the words of General Douglas MacArthur. The military service of the Republic carries with it honor, but also destruction, and the ideal that even death itself may become a boon when a man dies that a nation may live and fulfill its destiny. The two countries of Japan and the United States have a new relationship now both shared that patriotic fervor once upon a time, but at what price? Now it is a time of forgiveness and friendship. Tourism reigns, and ironically, the destruction and tragedy of war itself is now part of that tourism. But new life begins and goes on, and as always, change and regeneration is carried on by both man and nature. The ocean takes and gives new life. Pearl Harbor was a second in time compared to the millions of years it will take this new Hawaiian island of Lo'ihi to form. Meanwhile, life goes on above the water's edge. People remember and heed the lessons of war. Beauty and peace have once again taken over these islands called Hawaii, the only state to have been invaded by the enemy in that last hopefully the very last world war. And the spirit of aloha, hope, forgiveness, and friendship reaches out to the thousands who visit to take home and share with others all over the world.